All right, so this morning we are speaking about um, it's actually two portions of Scripture, a double portion again today. But we are only going to deal with Acharemot. Acharemot, it is after the death of Nara of Abihu. But really things started to change way back when, after the death of Adam and Chava, really. When they when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the father said, If you eat of this day of this tree, you will surely die. And ever since that day we are battling with death in our lives. And um, I think this is the essence of um, of why why did Adam and Chava eat of the fruit? Why did they take and eat of the fruit? What was the reason? What do you think? A serpent told them to. But why what was what was the reason? They wanted to be like our father. So it is a, I think it is a, a, it, it is an act of zeal. They wanted to be the best they possibly can uh, and in the light of our father. But it was not given for them at that time. It was firstly not what our father commanded and it was out of time as well. Because remember, if we want to be like our father, how can, how can, we, how can we be like our father? How can we be like Messiah? Isn't the, the New Testament, the apostolic scriptures, continually, continuously telling us that we need to be transformed into the image of the Son? That's what, that's what uh, Chava tried to do. It was a little bit premature there. And um, I think, uh, what was the reason that Nadav and Abihu did what they did? Same reason. Same reason. It was, they took their senses and they wanted to rush into a place that they were not called to go at this stage so so I think um, if we look at the if we look at the, the idea surrounding remember back in Leviticus 10 it was speaking about Naraf and Abu and what happened to them and now we are in 16 and in the context of Yom Kippur uh, we are said that the name of the portion is Akharemot after the deaths of Naraf and Abu so what happened in the meantime between uh, chapter 10 and chapter 16. What did we deal with in the last two weeks? Firstly, firstly, chapter 11 is about what we should eat and not eat. How do we present ourselves before the Father every day? Continuously in the mundane things like just eating and being. And then 12 and 13, I think to a portion of 14, is about um, of, uh, when a woman conceives and then Tzara'at. Remember we spoke about Tzara'at. Last week, so how do we how do we keep the uncleanness out of the camp, so that the tabernacle of our father is not defiled? That's what Marlies told me this morning. Is what do the what do the people do that contam that get contaminated, defiled, tamay? What what are they prohibited from? Do they need to go out the camp? Where do they need to go? Actually, not. You can remain in your tent. You just ceremonially unclean. You cannot just go to the tabernacle. You can't only go for worshipping in the tabernacle. Remember, it's just the person that contracted leprosy, Tzara'at, that is set out of the camp. But if you're ceremoniously unclean, you can stay within your camp. You can do your things that you do. You're like a woman that just gave birth or in a monthly period. You just remain in a house, but you can't go to the tabernacle. That was the, that was the effect that uh, uncleanness had on you for that time. And I think if we... If you look at what um, um, what the realities of the Shema is, today, this morning I shortcutted the Shema. The Shema is Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And then we have inserted the second line to take out all the rest, and that is Baruch Shem Kivot Malchutulei Olam Ba'et. Is blessed be your name forever, your kingdom or your kingdom forever. Um, really, the Shema goes, The second line, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your being, and you shall... And it goes on until you shall teach your children. You know, so, so that's really the full Shema. But I think if we look at the whole context of what the Shema is, it is a life of total surrender. It is uh, surrendering ourselves and, uh, and keeping the Father's voice, His word in our hearts at all times, and just walk with Him. You know, a life of contentment in his presence. That's really what it is. So, why did they die then? 
Why did Nara van Abiu, why did they have to die? What do you think? I don't hear. Okay, so it says that if you are if you are wrong, if you're acting in the wrong way, if you're not approaching our Father in a pro proper protocol, then they as priests are a symbol. They are a they are a um, an example of how do we approach our Father. And if they get it wrong, then the rest of the nation gets confused. So to protect the protect the nation, that's why they had to go. That's why Adam and Chava had to step outside of, of the Garden of Eden so that they will not remain in the garden and perhaps eat of the tree of the fruit of life, of the tree of life, and remain alive in the false state for the rest of humanity. You know? So, same with them. So, where are we? So, what did they want to do? Let's just, we're going to focus on, on this. Um, what I actually wanted to do today is speak about. Uh, the seven elements of the high priestly prayer of Yeshua in John 17. And I wanted to give you some background before we get there, and it ended up only the background for today. We'll speak about that next next week. And now things go. So, so um, what did they want to do in the first place? They took their senses, remember? Nadav and Abiyu had their senses with them, and they... Um, they came in from the from the outer court into the holy place with their senses. Where does the senses go there? What is your plan with the censer? Where is the where does the censer belong? Do you know? Well, it uh, the censer belongs with the incense altar. But what does the censer actually do that the incense altar cannot do? It goes into the holy of holies. That's where it goes to. That's why you find in uh, Hebrews 9, which we will go to, uh, a strange verse that says that the incense altar be belongs beyond the deuteros, beyond the second veil. And you know it's not the case. You know it's on, in the holy place, in the protos, in the, in the first place. But uh, Hebrews 9, somewhere 4, I think, says that it's in the second, in the, uh, in the whole, most holy place. Which is a problem uh, in understanding because it appears to be wrong. But if you if you look at the word there, it speaks about the censer, not the altar. But okay, we'll get there. So what they did is they offered strange fire. Um, chapter 16, verse 12 says, they offered strange fire. Now I'm going to sit because I've, had, I've got a sore leg, so don't worry about me. Um, it says that they were to offer strange fire. Where does the strange fire come from? Why? What is the correct fire? What would be the fire that the Father had in mind? What's that? Okay, so strange. Where does the? Okay, let's start there. Where is the fire that that needs to the coals that needs to burn in the incense altar? Where does that come from? From the altar, the mizbeach, the altar outside. So what the priest does is he brings a shovel full of um, a brass shovel full of coals from the mizbeach from the altar, and he puts it into the to the uh, to the golden altar, the altar of incense. Okay, so that's and then the hands full of uh, of incense is poured into the altar of incense, and it it produces a cloud of smoke. So it's a very intense place to be in the holy place because there's very little light. There's just seven candles or seven oil lamps, and this incense that is burned. But they brought strange fire, and strange fire doesn't come from the fire that our father lit. Because remember, the fire, the fire started with our father that produced the fire so that the altar can start. So, we know the word for coals is gechel. Andali mentioned something interesting, is that, um, why coals? Why is it, what is, well, coals break down into the form of, okay? And this is, this is really, um, coals is, uh, what is, he, what is the, um, carbon, it's carbon, that's what I'm looking for. So it's really carbon. It's the lowest form of existence. It's the it is carbon that it breaks down into. And um, if you burn a tree, if you burn wood, eventually it ends up being there. All right. So so and and um, what did the Messiah? What did the Messiah bring? How did he make atonement for us? And this is today's talk. Is how did Messiah make atonement for us? On the tree. All right. There's the connection with the tree. But with his, with his blood, 
Okay? He brought his blood. But uh, in today's Yom Kippur service, the full picture of his atonement is, is painted for us in the person of the, uh, of the high priest. All right, so we'll go through that and see what it says. But the, the coals, if you look at the tree, now think of the tree of life. What is the tree of life initially in the garden? What was the, the tree of life? How do we understand the tree of life to be? It is the word of the Father. His fullness, His light, His full glory is in the tree of life. Okay? We'll see in the end, in Revelations, we see the tree of life outside of the city, and, and its leaves produce, it leaves is the healing of the nations and its fruit, etc. So what happened to Messiah, who is the living word? He's crucified outside, and he turned into the lowest form of his being into death. So there's a connection there. Taking the poison out, out of humanity by the blood of Messiah, by him being killed, and if we think about the living word being burned, really, then the coals are coming back to produce life. You know? What do we use um, carbon for these days in our bodies? Did you know if you eat something that's poisonous, if you eat something that's not really going well with you, there's nice carbon um, um, tablets that you take that extracts the, it extracts the poison from your body. It's, it works very well. I had a problem uh, in uh, the Bavian with um, the te terrible stomach ache, and I just took carbon from from the fire and I ate the carbon. It's not tasting exceptionally well, but um, but it worked like like this. The next morning I was back and everything was good. So carbon extracts it attaches to poison and it brings it out of your body. It's a wonderful thing. So so the so the the three letters there is a gamal of a gimel a chet and a lamet. No no. Uh, Gimel is the is a word that stands for a gamal. It is a camel. You see, it actually looks like a camel. You see, it bent over, front feet, back feet. It takes you somewhere. You know, it's loaded, usually with good stuff. In the days of Eliezer, it was loaded for the bride. You know, presenting gifts. So it is a sent one. A gamal is also a sent one. And what is it sent with? With chai, with life. Chai, sent with life. And the Lamet is the teaching, this, the, the staff of authority or teaching. So, coals are brought into the altar as some, uh, something that he sent as to produce life and teach us about the goodness of the Messiah. So, I think that's what it says. So, for these two guys, for Nadav and Abiyu, they were ordinary priests and they had to serve us at the, misbe at the, at the Misbeach, outside the bronze altar. That's where they that's where they had to be because, because they um, they weren't in a position yet to go into the golden altar of incense. That was given for the high priest. That was given for the high priest to burn the incense to to present the nation before our father and our father to the nation. He was the he was the intermediate tree. What is the right word? intermediary oh i've got i've got some help here so <clears throat> okay so um they were to function at the brazen altar at that stage but they had the zeal in their lives that overwhelmed them because remember what is who is in the holy of holies the shekhinah is in the is in the most holy place and don't we have this amazing this wonderful desire to commune commune with our father properly and this is what i think they've done is they 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 weren't content with what the service that the father had for them they were in a much closer position uh, than the rest of us all they were in a privileged position to serve as priests but that wasn't not enough for them so so i think uh, if you compare aaron to Nadav and abu he did his service for the glory of our father and they had their own experience in mind. And I think that is, that's, the basic, that's the basic difference that they had. So, the timing that they had, the timing, why was the timing off? Because remember, if, if um, Aaron would have passed away, he would have been the next high priest. This, his sons, one of them, would have had that privilege. But they just 
didn't wait enough. They didn't give it enough time. So, so all sorts of nations in the world, different religions, has got a way to approach our Father. Build a stairway to heaven. In China, apparently, there's this place that they see that gap there as the window to heaven. And, and various religions has got a has got a manner to get to the closeness and to the place of our Father. But this is not what the Father called for. This is not what He commanded. And I think, I think um, even in our sometimes in the in our interpretations of Christianity, we are missing it in some ways. You know, so we are in a place that we want to restore our lives and restore the proper understanding of how to approach the Father, and that we can commune with Him in the ways that He had in mind for us from the beginning. So, for us, we are going into the throne room, and remember, we sang the song this morning. We enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of the Lamb. No, we sang that song. So, so <coughs> how did the priest enter into the Holy of Holies, the high priest? Through the veil, yes. With what in hand? He had, he had a lot of stuff in his hands. He had coals, he had incense, and he had the blood of the goat. Remember? So, okay, we'll get there. So, for now, I think, um, for us in our daily walk, if we've got a zeal for the Father, and this is one of the, the I think, uh, one of the modern trappings. It's probably not as modern as we think. But one of our, one of the problems that we that we have as as, um, as believers is restoring the proper worship, the proper service in our Father. There is a problem with zeal. Zeal can lead us to life, or it can lead us to death. Not often I'll be experience the death part of it. So if we pursue things that can distract us from the truth of what the scripture presents if it if we pursue things that lead us away from what our father wants uh, us to do it won't leave us to life it will take us on a turn off and i think this is why we need each other and we need to walk in the scripture so that we can remain true to what the father wants us to do and where he wants us to go so these two guys approached and it sort of backfired on them. You know, it's, it didn't work for them. So, we had a, we have a, 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 we have an opportunity and a calling to approach out the throne of our Father. But I think we need to understand how do we do that, and how do we pursue our Father? How do we seek His face daily? And um, sometimes um, the picture is drawn, and we get it from Hebrews, and that's why I think Hebrews. I'm going to try to spend the next two or three weeks in Hebrews, so that we can just get a understanding what uh, what uh, m uh, the writer of Hebrews wanted us to believe, because he draws a lot of information from the Torah and the Tanakh, and giving us a picture of Messiah, about his sonship, his di divine character, his high priesthood, all the things that we need to know of him to pursue him in this day. You know, so so how do we approach him? If we start outside at the Mizbeach, at the, at the altar, the bronze altar, the bronze altar is a mixture, it's an alloy. Man intervened in the, in, the, in the purity of the copper, brought some stuff in and made it a bronze altar. Now, it's, it is, this is our Father's command, to paint, to paint a picture of what it is. So, but if we... If, uh, so that's not the fullness of worship. That is the start. That's where we bring our gift to approach the Father. But there's deeper levels of understanding and deeper levels in how to approach our Father to go into the holy place. Then we find the, the menorah that we can walk in the sevenfold uh, manifestation of our Father's presence and you know all of the beauty of the holy place. And then the next step is where the high priest gets to go in. So the Mizbeach is not the final solution. The Mizbeach is the beginning of our worship. And the Father. So, so uh, I think um, even in the Mizbeach, even in the altar, remember in the sacrifices that we studied in uh, Leviticus, early in Leviticus, it says that some of those sacrifices that we need to bring to the Father, which is compulsory, it says they are most holy. They are most holy to the Israelites. Remember? It says a lot of them, it says three of them is most holy. So, what is the understanding of most holy? Kodesh HaKodeshim. It is the same as the most holy place, the, the holy of holies. So, for me as an Israelite, or for, for a normal Israelite believer, if you bring a gift to the Father, what is the most holy place for you? 
what is the the place of your furthest penetration into our Father's presence? It is that altar. It is that one. You can't take your gift out. If it is found to be improper, it stays there because it's most holy. It cannot be contaminated with normal life again. So the the blood of your little lamiki that you bring, it is splattered against the horns of the of that bronze altar, and it stays there. And that is the that is a korban. That is the way that you draw near to the Father. That is the closest that you can get to Him in the setup of the tabernacle. So. So I think um, for these two guys, and we're primarily speaking about them, is that um, as a priest, we as priests, we've got a certain responsibility. What is our responsibility as priests? We see it in, we see it in Malachi. What is the responsibility of a priest? What are, what's a priest to do? We are to proclaim what's clean and unclean, remember? And what is holy and what is common. That's what it says in Malachi. It says, this is what a priest does, as he says what is set apart to the Father and what is not, what is clean and what is unclean. And if we start to confuse what is clean and unclean and holy and not holy, then we are disregarding our responsibility and we are giving a false teaching to the people that are listening to us, and then we are entering in confusion. And that's why we've got 40,000 denominations in the world, is because we are confusing these things. So if we want to be restored into what the Father has for us and what He said that we should proclaim to be, to be set apart and not set apart, then we must get back to the original intent of Scripture. Stimulus on. So it is a long road. It is not something, it doesn't come by one day of understanding. It is something that we have got to unlearn certain things and pick up other things so that we can be restored to what the Father had for us in the beginning. So... So in Messiah's time, in Messiah's time, when what happened at his death? Let's read Hebrews 4:14. 4, it says, "Therefore, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, so where did he come from? He came from the presence of our Father, because remember, it is the heavens is a euphemism for the presence of our Father. Yeshua, the Son of Elohim, let us hold fast our confession." For we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who was tried in all respects as we are apart from sin. Meaning that he didn't sin. Therefore let us come boldly to the throne of favor in order to receive compassion and find favor for timely help. Now this is one of the, the texts that is understood that the veil is now torn. Okay? Alright, do you agree? The veil is torn and we can come boldly into the presence of our Father. Because for us as, as Christian believers, the veil has been rent, it's been torn, it's opened, and uh, there is no more division between the holy place and the most holy place. We've got access to the most holy place at will. But I don't think it is, I don't think that's a proper understanding. Because remember, is it in this text I forgot, is where where Messiah's flesh became the veil. Remember, it says that, that the, the, the veil of separation is done away with, but now Messiah's flesh is becoming the veil. So we need to understand how do we enter into communion with the Father? How do we, how do we go to the Father? Can we go because we are, we are a priest like Nada van Abiu, we are part of the priestly, of the priesthood, we can rush into the most holy place, or do we need a high priest still? You know? So and, and if we get that wrong, our zeal might consume us. You know? So Okay, in that in that um, in the renting of in the tearing of the, the caporet of the of the veil of the veil we, we find that we now have an opened door to enter in communication with our father psalms 24 7 he's got a nice little thing and i was thinking about the door and it's always interesting if you if you look at the if you look at the pictures that's a recent photo taken in jerusalem um it's um it is by the way it's a model <laughs> so do you recognize how, how high that door is do you see how high the door is into the early place 
24 meters. Why are the doors so high in temples? Because it's not only in this temple, it was most other temples the same story. Why are the doors 24 meters high? I mean, look at in perspective to the specs of people that's standing around there. I mean, do we really need that? It says in Psalm 24, 7, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. What is the head of a gate? The lintel. It is the lintel. It says, And be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. It is just a symbol. It's symbolic of the greatness of our Father. The greatness of our King that won't fit through a normal door like you and I fit through. It is, and even in those doors, for the king to come in, the heads must be lifted up so that the king of glory can come in. So, how did that happen? If we read Matthew 27, 50 to 51, it will give us an idea. I can't remember what it says. I'll have to read it. Uh, Matthew, Matthew 27. I hope it says something with all. Let's say, But Yeshua again, crying out with a loud voice, released his spirit. And behold, okay, this is the veil. And this is the, when the door opened for us to go into the presence of our Father. Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth was shaken and the rocks were split. Okay, that's another story. Why did the veil tear? Why did the veil, why was it torn? How did it get torn? Because of because one or two interpretations. Either the rock was rocks, there was an earthquake, and because of the movement of everything, the the the, uh, the, the curtain was torn, or um, the curtain was torn, and sometime later the, the earth was split. What do you think? We must actually work through that portion of scripture because it's very interesting. We bundle everything together, but it's really a three-day process. You know, so. Um, in any case, our father has torn his garment because of his son that died. And that's why the, the, the veil was torn. So, so, for a priest, for someone like you and I that wants to approach the father, we need to come through the proper door. For, it, for us as from the nations, for us as, as humanity, there's one, just one door that's provided in the tabernacle or in the temple. And that is the, the doors that's progressing into the, to the, to the most holy place. And this is the door that's provided we know is Yeshua. That's the only possible way that we can come to the door. And I think um, John 1.14 says that. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. A glorious, the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And that is the person that we are entering through into the, to the most holy place. And um, we see that it is the word that became flesh. So, the word is the living word. Let's just get that clear. The word was the living word for, with the Father right from the very beginning. In the beginning was the word and the word was with our Father. We agree. Okay? And um, when did Yeshua come into to place? When did Yeshua come into being? The person, the man of Yeshua, started 2,000 years ago. When the man started on Yeshua, the man, 2,000 years ago. But he was the incarnated word that was with the Father from right from the very beginning, before the foundation of the world. So right from before the foundation of the world, the word existed. And when our Father sent through his Ruach, sent his, his son, the living word, into Miriam, the word became flesh. And he's dwelling with the Father. That person's name is Yeshua. Beforehand, it was the living word. Okay. Can we sort of... It's a perspective. Okay. So, he holds the priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Hebrews 7.24 says. So, he holds the priesthood permanently. Since when does he have the priesthood? Right from the beginning. Because we see in, in, in uh, Hebrews, it says that um, he is, later on in Hebrews, he is compared to the Melchizedek priesthood. Okay, so you've got a priesthood of Melchizedek, 
that is a uh, that is the blueprint of priesthood that exists in the heavens and then the levitical priesthood is a symbol of what's happening in the heavens so the levitical priesthood functioned on the earth from Moses' time to today it's still in our day and it will be throughout the millennium and they are a reflection of what's happening in the Melchizedek priesthood okay so Messiah was a priest or he is a priest permanently because he continues forever and but to the son our father says your throne O Elohim is forever and ever a scepter of straightness is the scepter of your reign so in the Psalms we find a strong connection to this the scepter that the father puts in place so the throne of Yeshua is forever and sometimes uh, <laughs> we'll speak about the divinity of Messiah in time to come but there's a but there is a tendency to take this in, into to analyze and to look at this and to look at the trends and see what's happening and and I think um, in many people's minds we get confused of who our Messiah is and who, what's happening so we'll speak about that so Hebrews 10 verse 9 says seven so brothers having boldness to enter into the set apart place blood of, by the blood of our Messiah how do we enter into the set apart place by the blood of our Messiah by the death of Messiah what, how can we now because remember that the curtain was rent when he, with his death and his flesh replaced the curtain so now through the death of Messiah the blood of Messiah is a euphemism for his death so by the by by us attaching our lives and our hope and our and our existence to his death and resurrection we have now a, a right of entry into the most holy place but in Messiah our high priest remember we cannot enter in it into the most holy place and uh, get in our father's lap and pull his beard sort of thing by our own you know which no that's sort of the way sometimes it's brought um, we still have a relationship of prayer a relationship of prayer and coming into our father's presence through what messiah does and messiah comes into most holy place presenting his blood bringing the coals from the altar as it as a sign of what happened right in the beginning and the incense that presents the prayers of the saints 10 verse 20 says by a new and living way let's just read 19 again so brothers having boldness to enter the set apart place by the blood of Yeshua by a new and living way which he instituted for us when through the veil that is his flesh remember the veil is replaced by his flesh what happened to the physical veil that was in the temple what do you think it was torn and then do you think the Levitical priesthood just left it hanging in two I think they sewed that thing together as quick as can be because remember what it constituted for for them but in the heavenlies and in the spiritual it happened so happened that in the father's reality that the, the veil is torn replaced by his flesh having a high priest over the house of Elohim let us draw near with a true heart and completeness of faith having our hearts sprinkled from a wicked conscience and our bodies washed in clean water what is our heart sprinkled with by the way the blood of the lamb so there are two elements the blood of the lamb and the clean water of the word let us hold fast the confession of our expectation without yielding for he who promised is trustworthy and let us be concerned for one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the habit is of some but encouraging so much more as you see the day coming near so what remains is that you are coming into the presence of our father but through a new and living way which he instituted for us normal people we can now we are not a nada from an abu that had the privilege of serving in the tabernacle remember we were outside but now because we are one peter 2 9's royal priesthood we can now come into the holy place but we still need our high priest to present with the incense okay we'll get to that with the incense into the most holy place the only possible way if we don't confess that we need our high priest to enter in the most holy place we will end up being carried out by our garments so why is he 
Boy, remember in this portion of 16, chapter 16, which we read this morning, it's all about the, the service of, on Yom Kippur. What is the service of Yom Kippur? What is, it, what is the focus of that service? Atonement. It's, bringing, it's making atonement. What happened on the, on the first Yom Kippur in uh, Sinai? What, hap- what was the context? What happened in the... What was trailing behind? Remember in Shavuot, Moshe went up the mountain actually days before and then um, no on Shavuot the words of our father the Ten Commandments were given then Moshe again went up the mountain to receive the tablets of evidence the Ten Words and when he was taking his time 40 days they built a golden calf okay so when Moses came down he broke the two tablets and he had to go back up the mountain to fetch the second set of two tablets and when he came back, at the, and that was when Exodus 34 happened, where um, our father showed himself in his glory, and, and he heard that the nation was making a party down at the bottom. And, uh, no, sorry, that's before. I'm, I'm dear Makar, I'm sorry. So when he came down, his face was lit, and he came in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the symbol of the second coming of Messiah. And that's when the atonement was made. That was the first Yom Kippur. So that was the first time that we have celebrated this. So, the heavenly priesthood of our Messiah was essential because it's our only way of communication with the Father. And, it's, and if we look at this whole atonement service that, that we are seeing playing off before us, then um, everything that happens beyond the veil, everything that happens beyond the veil is anything to do with Yom Kippur. And we need to read this. It's for there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, the protos. It is where we are now. In which we the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread is. Remember that the, the tabernacle measured 20 by 10 by 10. 2,000 cubits. 2,000 years since Messiah. We are functioning in the holy place at the moment. Where we can intercede for the 12, the 12, 12 tribes, the fullness of believers. We are in the evidence of the menorah. We, we are looking at the, at the sevenfold spirit of our Father. We are standing at the altar of incense where we can offer our prayers. In this 2,000 years, that's where we are. But there is a cubit in front of us, a cube with 10 by 10 by 10, a thousand, where we will enter into the presence of our Father in the millennium, a thousand years. That's where we are going. So what we are saying is, the holy place is where we are now. Behind the Deuteros veil, the second veil, there is a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense. And you see, that's where the confusion comes in. Because where is the golden altar of incense? Is it in the most holy place? No, it is not. The golden altar of incense is in the first. Uh, and the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which there was a golden jar holding the manna, Aaron's rod, which budded in the tables of the covenant. So, so if we go ahead and we look at the altar of incense, we see that it's the word tumaterion in Greek, which can also mean a censer. So what was in the most holy place? It is the censer, which the priest took in once a year. So the, the, the censer that is going in is... Um, is one of the three items. First item is the blood of the sacrifice for himself, the bull, and the sacrifice that Israel brought, the goats, that comes from the brazen altar, the outside altar. Then the saints are full of coals. Where does that coals come from there? It comes from the brazen altar. But where does it go then? It goes to the incense altar. And where does it go then? Into the censer. So, it's almost as if the, the cult is progressing through stages of holiness as well. Yes, Irena. It, well, well, remember, the, the priest go and fetch the, the, the coals from the trees in the field. But I think it's a symbol. It's a symbol of, why would coals be such an important thing? And why was these two guys fired for not having the right coals, the, the, the right fire? You know? Why? Because the coals represented something. And I, I, it's a slip of the tongue. It is a, it is a, 
I think it's a symbol, and the incense presents our prayers, but it is ignited by the living word, which had to die for us to be ignited. I think it's a symbol of that. So I agree with Amelie. So the censer full of coals from the altar of incense is brought in. Two handfuls of incense is brought in so that the most holy place where the, uh, the high priest goes into can be filled with a cloud. That sweet, it almost, it's, I think it's, if, you, if you've ever had incense burning in a place, it is heavy. You know, it is a, it's a thick atmosphere. So, in the Most Holy Place, there was this cloud that, that, why was it necessary for a cloud, such a thick cloud, in the Most Holy Place, for the High Priest? It's the Shekhinah that's here, and it says, so that the High Priest will live, there must be a thick cloud, so that he cannot perceive the presence of the Father. You know? So, that's, a, that's interesting, if we think about the incense presenting our prayers. If we want to enter into the most holy place where the Father is, we must do it with a volume of prayer. It comes through prayer, because without prayer we will not survive in the Father's presence. So, two elements are needed, really. Blood and incense. And this is the fullness of the atonement that Yeshua makes. It's blood and incense. So, that was too fast. So, blood represents an innocent life for the guilty. We know Yeshua, the life of an innocent, given to us as guilty, the guilty party. What does the, the incense represent? Prayer, we've said it. So, those two elements are very needed. And if we look at the, at the, at the practice of, of the service of Yom Kippur, those two things were necessary to achieve atonement. Not only the blood, but those two components is what was needed. So, Psalm 141 says, May my prayer be counted as incense before you. It's just um, sort of a proof text that incense is prayer. When you had taken the, of the book, the four, now think about what the incense will do in the future. When you had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which the prayers of the saints went up before our Father's angel's hand. So, so what was the prayers used for of the saints? Interceding. Why are we praying? What are we praying for? Is for the salvation of humanity. We are praying, we are interceding for our brothers and sisters. We are praying for the salvation of the world. And that the angel pours on, on the earth so that the remnant can be saved. That's how our, our intercession works. So, the prank is fikir. Yeah, you should have to go to the house. You should have to go to the house. Remember, in the most holy place, the, the high priest doesn't go in fully clothed like that. He just goes in with his linen garments. So, you're right. Uh, yes, everything, everything belonging to the outer court is bronze. Anything belonging to the holy place is golden. The most holy place as well, golden. If you come into the holy place, then... You've got a curtain at your back, you've got a curtain in front, and you've got two golden walls. So in the holy place, you start having a reflection of who you are, and you can restore what's inside. But it's two sides. If you go into the most holy place, how many sides are gold? Three. Three sides are gold. Behind you is a curtain, but now you are presented with more of, you know, your purity, your that's why the psalm says, who can ascend to the hill of our Father, those with pure heart and clean hands. So that's the only possible way that you can get there. So, Okay, so the death of Yeshua, which is uh, spoken of as the blood, is, as well as his intercession, is necessary to effect our redemption. So how did that happen in the life of Yeshua? Let's think. At Pesach, what happened? What happened at Pesach? He presented... 
well, his blood was poured out for us. Okay? Okay, his life was poured out for us. You're right. So, and what happened then? Because now the blood is poured out, but is, is that is atonement made? It must still, remember, it must still go to the most holy place. So what happened in the next day? What, no, not the next day. What happened at first fruits? What happened at first fruits? He said to Mary, don't touch me because I need to present myself before the Father. So he had to show himself as the first fruits of the resurrection. And I think that is where it started to happen. Is that when he went to the most holy place, what did he do? He presented the evidence of his death, the blood, and he went to pray for us as his nation. Prayer, incense, and his blood. Yes. Can we just get a mic, please, Josh? There are people on somewhere that's going to battle to hear you. Um, I was listening to um, Tim Macking on the Bible Project, also on the priesthood. He's also got a series now on the priesthood. Okay. And I was just thinking, uh, Yeshua Messiah, he said, I'm going to up to the Father present, but I wonder if it's not still going on. Yes, of course. Um, yeah. He I think it wasn't the ones off. It's still no. carrying on now. He's making intercession for us continually. Continually. Because that is how our salvation is secured. Is by Him interceding for us. The whole time. So, so the process of the Yom Kippur is uh, service is the offerings, the, the goats are brought by Israel. Remember the offerings comes from us. It's not the Levitical priest that goes search for the offerings. The perfect sacrifice is brought by, by Israel. And then the coals journey from the trees to the altar. It's burnt on the altar in coals. It's taken from the altar to the next altar, from the bronze to the gold from the gold to the censer, into the most holy place. Okay? So once this, once the sacrifice is made on the altar, the blood must be applied to the Ark of the Covenant. And I think this is what Yeshua had to do. Is once the, once the sacrifice that He made, the completion is not that, but the completion takes place when that blood is applied to the altar, or to the Aaron, to the in the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant. So that's what that's what the the high priest did, as he took the blood of the goat, and he applied it before the before the um, Ark of the Covenant. You agree? So, and I think this is what Yeshua is doing. the 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 evidence of his death is before the Father, of a, of his perfect life, is before the Father, and he continually he continues to make intercession for us, and that affects affects our continual atonement so but there's a thing it says and this is application for us remember the responsibility is not only his remember Pesach and unleavened bread it's a beautiful picture Pesach is the responsibility of the king to make a to present himself as a sacrifice unleavened bread is given for us to identify with his life so that we can be purified this is a support for that. It says, test yourselves to see. He's speaking to the believing community, not the people out there. If you are in the faith, examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Yeshua is in you? Unless indeed you fail the test. So what's the test? It's for each of us. And this is the, this is the Yom Kippur focus for us as believers. On Yom Kippur, the nation of Israel goes, or they come, and they they look at their own lives and see if their lives are inscribed in the book of life. Remember, that's what we do on Yom Kippur. So, how do we how do we uh, recognize this about us? Firstly, we examine our own hearts to see if if we are bearing fruit of the kingdom. We are looking at the evidence of our faith. Is is our fruit? that we are bearing, is it, uh, is it the same what we believe? Are we doing it outside the same that we believe inside? What is, what's happening? And um, who is the one that we are trusting in? Is the one that we are trusting in the true king of Israel? Or did we change his identity? Did we change his identity to suit our purpose? You know? And that's one of the risks that we have. It's through many years of of existence through many years of belief 
we um, we have the potential, unfortunately, to in our own minds and our own hearts and our own testimony to change the character of the one that we serve. He remains the same faithful as forever in scriptures as we see him, but our our testimony of that sometimes needs tweaking. And I hope this is what we are busy doing in restoring our lives to the original understanding and getting rid of things that we must lay down. So John 14, 6 says, Yom Kippur is a day to reflect where you are in your walk before Adonai. To affirm genuine faith in Messiah is the only way to the Father. That's the essence of John 14, 6. Genuine faith in Messiah is the only way to the Father. And unfortunately, um, if you look at what Christianity did to Yeshua, as we, we took him out of his cultural context, we took him out of his confession of where he were at, and changed him into a, a universal savior with blue eyes and long hair and with a white coat and a red sash. Roman royalty. That's how they are drawn. And we took him out of his Hebraic culture, and that's why we don't understand his words. That's why we don't understand his expression. We need to restore Yeshua to the one that was living 2,000 years ago on the earth and now present as in interceding for us in the throne room of our Father. So, so I think our, our, I'll be within our, our um, understanding of who our King is needs to be restored in our hearts. And I think this is what we are, will be chatting about in Hebrews. Is trying to get a proper understanding and re realigning ourselves with our Father's expression of who Yeshua is. Hopefully that will help us. Tony. Yes. So, remember if, if we are saying 1 John 2, 1 John 2 for 1 to 6, says essentially that we should walk after Him as his disciples in the in the in the lifestyle and in the example that he has given us so what example has he given us the example is is um, focused on in the days of unleavened bread where we can see he lived a, sin, a sinless life a beautiful life that glorified the father and everything and that's what we are going to so each one must examine his own work galatians 6 4 says Take stock of how we bear the burden of others and fulfilling the Torah of Moshe. So, as we are looking at our own lives, where are we focused? How are we focused upon the, the needs of the community, of the people around us? Do we do our own thing and look for our own benefit? You know, that's one of the one of the um, evidences of living a godly life moves us forward and set apart us to become conformed to the image of the one we confess to be our Master and Messiah. So are we growing in the testimony of our faith? Are we, are we being transformed into the image of the Son? I hope so. I hope that as we, um, as we are living the Torah, living in the Torah, as a lifestyle, everything that we do will be written on our hearts, will be inscribed on our hearts as the Father promises to do in Je Jeremiah 31. And so that what, doing the works of the what the Father prepared for us from before the foundation of the earth will become our nature. And as we do that, we are transformed into the image of the Son. That was His character. The example that He left for us was living out the Torah in the intention of the Father's heart. Remember, living the Torah is the easy thing to do. But living the Torah from the kingdom perspective, that is the intensified application of the Torah in our lives. So, I think we're about at the end. So Yeshua's intercession for all of us. What, what does it do? What does it, what does it achieve? Without the intercessory prayer of Messiah, I'm sorry it's a bit small. For all, without the intercessory prayer of our Messiah, our relationship with our Father hangs in the balance. But because He remains, as we saw before, His priesthood remains faithful and secure throughout the generations. 
His scepter doesn't leave him. His throne is secured. And because of that fact, we are secure. Even if we die, we will be resurrected because we are the quickened ones. We are the ones that's got the indwelling spirit within us. And we will be resurrected. And one, and Corinthians that says, examine us. We should examine ourselves. Remember, that's the thing. Saving faith brings a change of heart. If we continue with the heart that we have, in the hardness of hearts and doing all the stubborn things that we usually do, then our saving faith hasn't got the effect in our lives that it should. If we are still doing the same things now that we did a year ago, this last year didn't have an effect on our progression towards being transformed in the image of the sun. Okay? Okay, so it says in uh, chapter 12, verse 14, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification which without which no one will see our Father. So how will we see our Father? If we pursue peace with all men and sanctification. But we shouldn't take that out of context. Remember, there's a step before that. We must become part of the family. We must be part of the family through Yeshua's, through um, our faith in Yeshua. Because pursuing peace with all men and sanctification, learning the ways of Torah will not bring us there. It is only through the death and the resurrection, the, the evidence of the blood and, this, and the intercession of our Master that we are there in the first place. That's the background of the high priest, the functioning of the high priest of our Father. And if you read John 17, the longest prayer of Messiah is recorded in John 17, which is the high priestly prayer, which is a model of what he is praying for us today. And I think that's what we will speaking, be speaking about next week. All right, so, so all I want us to do, I know this, the only life application that we have from today's talk is go and look at the realities of Yom Kippur. We need to re-examine our lives if we are living a life that's pleasing to our Father. If we are other-centered, and are we bearing the fruits of the kingdom? That's it. Why are we doing these things? Because we've got an example of our King that laid his life down so that we can live. And that should be our focus. Yes, Tanis is it. That's a mic microphone handy. Abba, uh, Abba Yahweh, we want to come and thank you that the high priest of Yahuwah lives within us. We praise you for that. We want to be like you in every, in every way. So please come and En oortuig ons asjeblief van sonde, oordeel en gerechtigheid. By your Ruach HaKodesh, we want to live as you lived on this earth. And thank you for this teaching we had this morning. And that we can be here at your Shabbat. And we honor you and we bless you and we love you. And we say thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you, Suzette. All right. I think that concludes that. Um, Lo, any is there a question? Um, the, the tree of life in the garden and Yeshua on the tree and he is life. Can you say more about that, please? No. There is. There must be more. There must be, right. I think the only connection that I can make, remember this, remember it says to be crucified on a tree is actually a curse. That's a, that's a problem. And so, he became the curse for us. So, and he became the curse for us. But I think Yeshua in, its, in himself is the tree of life. Because the living word, the living word is seen... How do we produce what is, what's written on our hearts so that we will bear much fruit? And fruit for the kingdom, it's a seed of the word. The seed of the word becomes a tree of life within us so that we can bear fruit for the kingdom and that that fruit will bless the people around us. 
So if, if, the, if, if the word accomplishes that as growing from a seed, then the tree of life must be the full expression of the living word. And the full expression of the living word was found in Messiah. And Messiah was burned, sort of, at the stake. So the coals that's coming from the trees of the field represents, I think, to a certain extent. I might be wrong, but I think this is what it says. Thank is you. the coals are pure. And as the coals are presented by burning the sacrifice, the interaction between the word and the, sac the blood of the lamb is always there as an evidence for us as the accomplished work of, of Messiah. Okay. Uh, second thing, Johan. I don't know for who it is because many people might know the story, but there's someone here that does not know the story. The, what the uh, Jewish father would do when somebody comes and tells him, your son is dead, and how that relates then to the tearing of the veil. Do you want me to share it? Uh, it's for somebody here. I don't know who. But in, in the Jewish culture, if somebody comes to me and says to me, your son is dead, then I would take my coat and I would tear it and rip it apart to actually show my heart and my grief for my son. And that's exactly what our Heavenly Father did. The veil was not just torn because there was an earthquake. He actually tore his cloak yeah. to show his grief for what his son had to go through. So I think it's, somebody and, and I think if you no think that. about the reality of the veil, it is, um, the veil is a separation. The veil causes a separation between our Father's presence and the life of Israel. And the separation is to maintain, to maintain the life of Israel. Because the purity and everything that they come in is a little bit tainted for the Father to come into his presence still. That's why when even the high priest of old came into the presence of the Father, lots of incense smoke, etc., to sort of hide him in the smoke. And I think in Yeshua, the, the, the door is opening for us to come into a greater form of relationship with the Father as it is. Because now in Yeshua, the whole nation can be drawn in in a deeper relationship with our Father than that we've been in before. So it's not the tearing of the garment is not a sense of grief only for our father, but it was, but it is like um, we see in Hebrews 12. It says, "For Messiah endured the cross, scorning its shame, because of the joy that he saw in it." And I think the same story happened in our father's life. Is that it? Yes, Rian. Um, Sorry, um, when you mentioned about the wood coming from the field, I just saw a picture of how the world would come in, get burned on the altar, being yeah, getting purified. pure and holy, yeah. and then it's a progression of going into the holiness to our yeah. Father. You know, so I saw the field as the yeah. world out there. And yeah, it's interesting. I think this. I haven't thought it through, but I think it is. Um, there's definitely a picture in there. There's something in there. Because the wood, the wood is not only the wood is a gift from our Father to to enable His worship, you know. So it is definitely there as an enabler for worship, and He lit the fire in the first place. So we know the idea of fire is very important for our Father. Thank you.